All right, and with that, we're gonna move to our next speaker, Nathaniel Craig from Santa Barbara. He's gonna tell us about amplitudes and Hicks effective field theories. Great, thanks Hi, Nathaniel. so much. Hi there, Anastasia, thank you so much for the opportunity. Um, let me try to share my screen. Right, you should be good. Yeah. Am I insured? Um, yeah, thank you. Perfect. Okay, all right. Hopefully this is working all right. Yep. Okay. Um, great. Well, thanks. Thanks very much. Thank you again for uh, for, for putting on uh, amplitudes in this wonderful remote format. Uh, and thanks everyone for being here. Um, so I uh, I know I'm the only thing standing between most of you and either breakfast, lunch, or dinner, depending on which time zone you're connecting from. Uh, so I will try to uh, try to at least keep it amusing. Um, so it's it's nice to be back at amplitudes. The last time I was deeply engaged in amplitudes was in 2011 uh, when Henrietta and Michael Kiermaier were kind enough to let me uh, help them organize at Michigan. And uh, that was a fantastic experience, but I remember spending most of my time at Amplitude 2011 on my laptop because this was the period in which very specific rumors about uh, Higgs data were starting to come out and circulate. And of course led to uh, the uh, Atlas and CMS Jamboree uh, just a month later in which we got the first very concrete signs of the Higgs at 125 GeV. So that sort of marked a, a, an interesting departure point for my career in which, which I really dived into Higgs physics uh, and uh, have only really been coming back to amplitudes now much more recently. So it's very nice to bring these threads back together. And in some sense, uh, my purpose in giving this talk is really to come uh, to the amplitudes community as an emissary from the Higgs and the Higgs EFT community to try to convey some of the interesting things that are being developed uh, there right now and, and to advertise, I think, the sense in which there are questions that are hopefully very interesting to, uh, to amplitudes folks. Um, so, uh, in part, as Gavin uh, summarized very nicely this morning, we're in a very exciting period uh, as far as Higgs precision measurements at the LHC. Uh, so, of course, this is just a summary of a re recent Atlas data showing the, the convergence of measurements of Higgs properties in a variety of production and decay channels. And there are a number of remarkable things about this plot. One of them, of course, is just the narrowness of the error bars, which are a testament uh, necessarily to all of the progress that's been made in the amplitudes community over the past two decades uh, in making precise theory predictions. But the point that we're going to get to by the end of the HL LHC physics program uh, is of order 5 to 10 precision in many of these channels. And that really provides unprecedented tests uh, of the standard model in the Higgs sector. And in addition, you know, apart from the data we're currently getting at the LHC, we of course are also as a community now looking forward to future colliders that will succeed or even run in parallel with the LHC, primarily uh, uh, E plus D minus Higgs factories, in which the precision in certain channels should, should reach the sub-percent level, in fact, even approach the per mil level in some cases. Uh, of course, precision is, is fantastic, but at the end of the day, you, know, it's, you need to know what it is that the precision has actually told you. And so in the end, event either of increasing convergence with standard model predictions, or maybe more excitingly, in the event of disagreement, uh, that really invites a framework in which to understand what uh, agreement or disagreement means. Uh, and that framework, one of the most natural frameworks for interpreting agreement or disagreement with standard model predictions is, of course, uh, an effective field theory. So this is very strong, just the existence and uh, I think the relevance of this Higgs data over the next 20 years is very strong motivation to develop and understand Higgs EFTs uh, that are capable of uh, parameterizing deviations from standard model predictions. And so really the heart of this talk uh, is to communicate the sense in which the amplitudes and the amplitudes program, I think is very much key for understanding the properties of these Higgs EFTs. Uh, and in addition to, of course, my talk now, right after lunch, uh, we should have a great talk by Yael Shadmi getting into many of the details uh, of how the on-shell amplitudes program can connect to Higgs EFTs. Uh, so there are basically two, if you want to, to write down EFTs to describe uh, Higgs data, there are basically two EFT frameworks that make sense organized around the possible gauge symmetries that could be manifest by the low energy degrees of freedom. So these two EFTs nowadays, we mostly call them heft for the Higgs EFT. This is also sometimes referred to as the electric chiral Lagrangian with the Higgs, uh, where the only organizing symmetry is, is electromagnetism and no assumption is made about the relationship between uh, the, the CP even scalar Higgs that we've seen at the LHC and the Goldstone degree of freedom degrees of freedom that make up uh, the longitudinal modes in W and Z. The other alternative, of course, is to assume the full SU2 cross U1 invariance in your EFT, and this leads to the EFT that we now call the standard model EFT, in which we simply form uh, 
uh, operators out of uh, SU2 cross U1 invariants, including a manifest uh, Higgs doublet. And uh, here, the advantage of SMEFT, of the stronger assumption about the symmetry, is that the power counting is relatively manifest and straightforward in terms of the appearance of irrelevant operators that are suppressed by some, uh, by some higher scale. So these are the sort of two playgrounds uh, in which to parameterize Higgs data. And properly speaking, SMEFT is a subset of heft in the sense that you can always choose to go to the broken phase of SMEFT and write it as a heft. And I'll get back a little bit to the relationship between these two uh, towards the end of the talk. So there's a question, you know, why, why bother? Why bother to study these different EFTs? Uh, and really, at the end of the day, I think there are two reasons, and I will try to articulate uh, both of those reasons throughout the rest of the talk. There's the sort of in principle reason, which is that one of these is the theory of nature, at least the theory of nature, to the extent that EFTs are not UV complete, it's the theory of nature over experimentally accessible energies. And so we might as well study the heck out of it, right? This is to the same degree that just studying the structure of the standard model as a theory itself is valuable, so too is studying the structure of these EFTs, uh, even if the structure that one is studying may be out of reach of experimental precision. But there's also very much just the in-practice reason for studying, which is that these EFTs provide very meaningful guidance to experimental tests of Higgs properties, and the development of these Higgs EFTs and really the understanding of their intricacy has directly informed uh, the progress of experimental searches. But at the end of the day, you know, the real reason to bother with all of these things is that there is data, uh, and that is to say not just Higgs data in the, the sense of precision measurements of Higgs couplings, but the actual interpretation of that data by the collaborations in the context of these effective field theories. Uh, so on the left, this is uh, one of the more recent CMS summaries uh, of Higgs couplings in terms of parameterization of the couplings to different fermions and gauge bosons. And this, although this has been a parameterization of Higgs data by the collaborations, this is relatively straightforwardly interpreted in terms of some operators that exist in the heft parameterization of a Higgs EFT. Um, on the right-hand side, a much more recent development, which is the direct interpretation by at both Atlas and CMS uh, of experimental measurements in the space of SMEFT Wilson coefficients. So this is something that it, the theorists have been for the last decade, uh, but it is a much more intricate thing to do at the level of the experiments. And these measurements bring to bear uh, not just rate measurements, but also a variety of differential information uh, as packaged by uh, the simplified template cross-section approach. And so it's really remarkable now that we're beginning to get very uh, detailed experimental constraints on the Wilson coefficients within these EFT parameterizations. And so if nothing else, the fact that you know, we're learning a lot from the experiments now about these EFTs, this is very strong motivation for study structure in further detail. Uh, so what are the, the sense in which amplitudes are key to the, the understanding of these Higgs EFTs, I just sort of want to highlight four aspects. Uh, these four different aspects, uh, some of them draw upon work that's been done over the last few years, uh, but I also want to bring it up to the point uh, of research that's being done right now, just as an advertisement to those of you in the amplitudes community that there are very interesting questions here uh, to continue to push on. So of course, uh, there, there's lots of reasons why amplitudes are key, but many of the developments over the last few years hinge on two relatively simple observations. Uh, one of them is just that, you know, although these EFTs are typically formulated in some sort of Lagrangian basis, the freedom to transition uh, between bases using field redefinitions and equations of motion uh, means the most, a most natural basis for these EFTs is a basis in which uh, the operators are operators that excite definitely definite helicities in the massless limit. And that means the operators in these EFTs organize themselves nicely in the space of uh, field multiplicity and operator helicity. And the second observation is that the interface of these EFTs with the standard model, um, at the end of the day, it actually uh, uh, turns out to hinge very critically on the fact that the standard model is subject to well-known uh, helicity selection rules. And the ones that are most interesting or have been most interesting to date uh, are the helicity selection rules of vanishing, uh, so governing the vanishing of certain two to two uh, amplitudes uh, at tree level in the standard model. And so if you put these together, this actually turns out to tell us a lot about the properties of these EFTs. But maybe the first thing that you think about if you think about what amplitudes can offer to the Higgs EFT program is just precision, that is to say, uh, the power to compute uh, higher loop corrections in the structure of the theory. And I, I know what you're thinking. You're thinking, you know, we need uh, high precision and loops in the standard model because this is both the background hypothesis and the thing that we're testing to precision. Uh, if we are parameterizing a departure from the standard model in an EFT, we don't need the precision until we actually see a deviation. But it's a remarkable fact that because many of the direct measurements 
uh, of these EFT operators will not have incredibly high precision, that it can very often be the case that radiative corrections to certain operators take you into different final states that can be measured with much higher precision. And so computing the radiative structure of these EFTs at the level of observables actually allows us to come up with much stronger constraints uh, on operator coefficients and also to flatten, to flat, to, excuse me, to close off what would otherwise be flat directions uh, in the space of these coefficients. So it's just two simple examples. Uh, one of them is the observation that although we think about uh, measuring the Higgs self-coupling through dye Higgs production at the LHC. Uh, the fact of the matter is, if you have a deviation in the Higgs self-coupling, that also appears in radiative corrections to single Higgs production. And so the high precision that we have in single Higgs processes, actually, uh, once you compute the one loop contributions from deviations in the Higgs self-coupling, this actually allows you sensitivity that is at least comparable in magnitude to the sensitivity of direct measurements in individual channels. The situation is even more interesting and relevant if you think to feature colliders, uh, namely Higgs factories. Many of these, of course, are operating at center of mass energies that are only capable of single Higgs production, but they're also capable of attaining uh, nearly per mill precision in channels such as uh, the Z Higgs production. And so this is a situation where uh, one loop and multi-loop dependence on these Wilson coefficients in single Higgs production can actually give you an incredibly powerful handle uh, on deviations in the Higgs self-coupling, even when you're only producing the single Higgs bosons. So that's just an advertisement to say, you know, even though EFT departures uh, in the Higgs sector from the standard model are currently uh, you know, there's no, there's no, I think, strong sign in the data that departures are there. Precision in these EFTs is very valuable because it gives us new handles uh, on, the, on constraining these Wilson coefficients. All right, the next uh, point that I think is interesting, the contact between the amplitudes commuted in Higgs EFTs uh, is the sort of beloved uh, set of ideas surrounding positivity. So one of the great things, of course, of the last 15 years has been the revival of this recognition that uh, we can bound operator coefficients in EFTs using bedrock principles of QFT, like causality, analyticity, and unitarity. Uh, and this has been applied directly, particularly to the standard model EFT over the course of the last few years, uh, developing standard techniques uh, of positivity, in particular, primarily driving bounds by using uh, constraints coming from elastic scattering in the forward limit. And because these bounds are effective, effectively what they're doing are bounding the second derivatives of some forward operators with respect to Mandelstam S, uh, though that means that they are setting positivity bounds on Wilson coefficients of operators that exist at dimension eight in the standard model EFT, because those are the ones that can have enough derivatives uh, to populate the scaling of the amplitudes. And there's really two reasons to be interested in positivity bounds, I think, from the perspective of Higgs EFT. One is that, of course, it just shapes the viable parameter space uh, in which you would expect to see deviations. And because at the end of the day, we're, we're trying to place experimental constraints on very high dimensional parameter space, this really narrows down our focus. But another way you can think about this is that to the extent that an experiment is sensitive to signs of Wilson coefficients that might even be forbidden by positivity bounds, uh, understanding these positivity bounds really allows you to test the bedrock principles uh, of causality, analyticity, and unitarity at colliders in a very interesting way. Uh, so this just to illustrate some of the power of this approach, uh, here's an example uh, of bounds that were set recently um, on anomalous quartic gauge boson couplings. One of the interesting things to emphasize is you might be concerned that because positivity bounds are only applicable to dimension eight operators, that they will generally be superseded by the contributions from lower dimensional operators that are not bounded like dimension six. But there are a variety of reasons why in many channels the dimension eight operators should give you the leading physics. In some cases, the dimension six operators are constrained by related measurements. In other cases, non-interference theorems and loop suppression effects mean the dimension six effects are unimportant. And so you really can, uh, there are channels at the LHC in which measurements of final states are sensitive directly to the positivity bounds. So here's an illustration uh, from, uh, from a recent paper by, by Chen Zhang and his collaborators, just focusing on the anomalous quartic gauge couplings. And it just highlights that the allowed region uh, in the space of the experimental constraints, this being a plot from CMF, CMS, the allowed region is much smaller than, of course, uh, the region in which uh, the, the fit parameters are being fit. So these positivity bounds are really capable of shaping how we interpret experimental measurements. And you can think of this either as telling us to focus on the regions consistent with positivity bounds or to continue thinking in the entire space and elsewhere we're testing cherished principles of quantum field theory. So this is a development I think that's really taken hold in Higgs EFTs over the last two years, but there's a lot more to explore in particular uh, using more than just the relatively familiar forward elastic scattering bounds for positivity 
uh, it's possible to, uh, I think, get more powerful bounds and also to think about whether it is possible to set robust positivity bounds at dimension six. Uh, so moving to my, my third point of contact between amplitudes and the Higgs EFTs, uh, there's simply a lot that the amplitudes program can tell us about where the best place is to look for evidence for uh, departures from the standard model in Higgs data. And the basic idea here is just that, you know, anytime you have an EFT parameterization where the power counting is an energy, the natural thing to do is to think about looking for deviations uh, in interference terms between standard model contributions and EFT contributions because those have the least energy suppression. So normally we think about, for example, constraining dimension six contributions uh, from the EFTs in their interference with the standard model term as being the leading sign of new physics. But it's a simple and very beautiful observation that the helicity selection rules that operate in the standard model actually forbid the leading interference in many two to two channels. This was uh, nicely articulated in a paper by Camila Machado and her collaborators a few years ago, that uh, if you simply look uh, in certain four particle amplitudes between the standard model and say the standard model EFT uh, for various final states, because of the holistic selection rules in the standard model, they're constrained in a certain set of holistic configurations. And those configurations are simply orthogonal to the holistic configurations that are populated by EFT operators uh, at dimension six. And so this actually tells you that there are a lot of circumstances where uh, the best way to look for evidence of new physics is not in the interference terms, but in fact is either by pushing higher uh, to higher order in your power counting to dimension eight, or by looking for the square of EFT operations. All right. So this is you know, a simple observation having to do with the holistic structure of the standard model, but it has a very significant impact on the experimental program. Uh, and the last point that I just want to highlight as far as what Amplitudes has brought to the Higgs EFT program over the last few years just has to do with the level of studying its properties. In fact, this, is, this was the set of observations that really at least brought me back into thinking about Amplitudes again, um, which is that you know, these EFTs, say the standard model EFT, there are operators now with Wilson coefficients that we normalize each other uh, uh, as we run to the infrared. And so simply studying the uh, renormalization group structure of these EFTs is also interesting. So very generally, you expect, of course, that the anomalous dimensions in these EFTs are non-zero whenever diagrams exist that would allow one operator to normalize the other. And just it turned out as a matter of, of, in some sense, experimental data of computing the matrix anomalous dimensions in the standard model EFT, uh, that this is not even remotely the case. So there are many cases where diagrams exist, but the diagrams didn't have logarithmic divergences that would feed into the matrix of anomalous dimensions. And so this is a cartoon pulled from a, a, a paper by, by uh, uh, Chung and Shen that I'll get to in a moment, but it just illustrates uh, the, the sort of entries with crosses are ones where there are no diagrams, but the entries with no crosses that are shaded in gray are situations where the, there are zeros in the matrix anomalous dimensions, despite the fact that there are operators, uh, excuse me, there are diagrams. And this just tells you that there's a huge sparsity uh, in the matrix anomalous dimensions relative to what you expected. So of course, uh, the amplitudes program at the end of the day, I think gave the most satisfying explanation for this phenomenon. Again, coming back to uh, the, the existence of standard model holistic selection rules. And the observation by Chang and Shen was simply that uh, the logarithms, of course, that gave you anomalous dimensions uh, could be extracted from, from the two particle cuts of these one loop diagrams. Uh, and then because those cuts are proportional to the product of tree amplitudes, the vanishing entries in the matrix anomalous dimension came because the standard model part uh, uh, of those, those product of tree amplitudes vanished by holistic selection rules. And so that allows the understanding of the majority, although not all, of the surprising zeros in the matrix of anomalous dimensions. And it's an interesting example of the interplay between uh, the holistic structure of the standard model and the radius structure of these EFTs. Um, so one thing you can ask uh, is what is the interface uh, between the sort of radius structure of the EFT and these non-interference theorems uh, that govern the interference between EFT contributions and the standard model. And so, of course, these non-interference theorems are violated by finite mass effects, uh, but they also should be violated by loop effects. And as we know, since all of the holistic selection rules in the standard model are violated at one loop, you would also expect that standard model loops should violate the holistic selection rules. Um, but it's also interesting to ask uh, what how the holistic selection rules can be violated, excuse me, how the non-interference theorems can be violated by loops proportional to EFT operators. And in some sense, this is an even more interesting question to ask, because if you actually um, drill down onto the operators that are constrained by the non-interference theorems, these EFT operators are formally one loop in perturbative UV completions. That is to say, their Wilson coefficients should show up at one loop. Uh, 
And so the non-interference theorems are already in some sense governing uh, the existence or non-existence of interference terms that show up at one loop standard model couplings and tree level Wilson coefficients. And so if loops of tree level EFT operators can violate uh, these non-interference theorems, then in some sense they would trivialize the non-interference theorem. So that sort of motivates thinking about uh, one loop uh, amplitudes that you have an insertion of a tree level EFT operator to see if they violate the helicity selection rules uh, that have separated the standard model EFT contribution. So this is one thing uh, that uh, for me and, and my collaborators, uh, Dave Sethel and Minyuan Zhang and, and Yingying Li, we recently motivated us to think about uh, amplitudes involved in insertion of a tree level operator that would violate helicity selection rules. So of course these uh, amplitudes have to be purely rational because there are no local operators in the EFT with the same holistic configurations to absorb divergences. And so we went ahead and computed large classes of these and found that many of them were zero despite the existence of diagrams. So here it's the amplitudes, the rational amplitudes themselves are zero. And at least it wasn't obvious from any of the existing theorems why, why that should be. So this tells us a number of interesting things. One, it tells us there's a whole host of vanishing rational amplitudes uh, in the standard model EFT. It tells us the non-interference theorems are robust because these are the diagrams that would have trivialized the non-interference theorem in a perturbative UV completion. And it also suggests, at least qualitatively, that we should expect to start seeing zeros in the two-loop matrix in almost dimensions to the extent that at least some cuts of these two-loop diagrams uh, for the matrix in almost dimensions would be proportional to one-loop diagrams that we now know to be vanishing. This is somewhat complementary to recent direct evidence we've also found uh, by Sveen collaborators for two-loop zeros, uh, two, three, and four-loop zeros in the matrix in almost dimensions using new selection rules, which I think you'll hear about from Svi uh, in his talk tomorrow. But this really suggests you know, that, that there is actually a very rich radiative structure to these EFTs that extends beyond just one loop accidents. That in fact, there are whole textures uh, in uh, the radiative corrections of this theory that uh, perhaps um, suggest hidden symmetries beyond the ones we've identified so far. Um, it turns out, I think, the, at least as far as these vanishing one loop rational amplitudes are concerned, uh, the amplitudes program really does at the end of the day provide the clearest way to understand why these exist. So this ties into recent developments made in the Higgs EFT community over the last year, uh, which are designed to use on-shell techniques uh, as a way of sidestepping many of the redundancies that plague a Lagrangian formulation of EFTs. So starting with work by Yael Shadmin, our collaborator, uh, which I think she'll tell us more about uh, later today after lunch, the whole perspective has been to simply define the Higgs EFTs via the amplitudes themselves and use the fact that there's a one-to-one -one correspondence between unfactorizable unshell amplitudes and independent operators in a complete basis. So we can simply define these EFTs uh, using unshell techniques. And so from the, uh, particularly with relevance to these uh, surprising vanishing rational amplitudes at one loop, one way you can use this onshell approach to understand the vanishing rational amplitudes um, is actually to construct uh, an amplitude basis that is basically the onshell partial wave basis. So of course, normally, Traditionally, when we uh, construct on-shell amplitudes, we do so in what we often think of as the sort of uncoupled Poincaré basis, where we manifest the Poincaré data of all of the external states. But you also, of course, can construct a basis of amplitudes uh, that manifests the sort of coupled representation, uh, the Poincaré properties of the, of the entire amplitude itself, uh, which is just a partial wave basis. And so one of the insights uh, from this very recent paper by Jing Xu and collaborators is that if you have two operators uh, that correspond in a one-to-one -one with some uh, on-shell amplitudes in a, in a partial wave basis, that if you're asking about the normalization of one operator by the other, if the two operators share at least two external legs, in this partial wave basis, the basis amplitudes must share the same total angular momentum. And this actually gives you an interesting new selection rule that controls uh, the classes of operators that can normalize each other. Uh, so here, this is just a table summarizing some of the interesting results. If you consider any two shared legs as defining a channel in which that also defines an angular momentum, J for the amplitude, uh, then of course you can classify in the standard model EFT various operators uh, by, by their J. And anytime you have a, a row of this table where you have the same channel, then if you have classes of operators at different J, those can't renormalize each other, even if they would have been allowed to renormalize each other by the selection rules of Chen and Chen. So this actually explains more zeros in the SMEF matrix and almost dimensions at dimension six. It also has the potential to explain the structure uh, of one loop zeros at dimension eight. 
the, the argument to get from this to vanishing one loop rational amplitudes is more complicated, of course, because the amplitudes don't themselves have definite angular momentum. Uh, but this also, this arguments lead to selection rules that turn out to explain all of the vanishing one loop amplitudes uh, uh, that we found. So there's a lot, I think, to be gained. You know, we're in the early days of an on-shell formulation of these EFTs, but it's clear that there's a lot to be gained from this approach. Um, just looking forward in my last few minutes, uh, so, you know, these operators, of course, at any order in power counting have an increasing number uh, of operators in the EFT. The enumeration of these operators itself was an interesting problem that was solved in 2015. Uh, this is a nice plot from, uh, from a paper by Jashuan Liu and collaborators where they used Hilbert series techniques to enumerate independent operators in the EFTs. And uh, my point is just to say that uh, we know a lot now, I think, about the structure, uh, both in terms of observables and radiative corrections uh, for the dimension six operators in the standard model EFT. But as we go up, of course, the increasing operator multiplicity uh, means that there's a lot that we don't know at the next order in power counting. So there's much to be understood employing these existing techniques at dimension eight. I think the other thing that uh, is really worth thinking about moving forward, looking to the future, is that most of what we've learned so far about the structure uh, or the relation between the amplitudes program and these Higgs EFTs has been in the context of the standard model EFT. Uh, partially, this is due to simplicity of the symmetries, partially it's sociological, but there's also a lot to be gained from thinking about what the amplitudes program can tell us about the heft EFT, uh, where SU21 is not manifest. So the first thing you would like to do to understand what questions are interesting for heft is simply to understand when you have to have an EFT that is written as heft and not SMEFT, since any SMEFT can be written as a heft, but it's not obvious that any heft can be written as a SMEFT. Uh, there was a very nice progress made in this classification in 2015 and 2016 by Alonso Jenkins and Manohar um, by articulating the sort of geometric perspective for the Higgs EFTs. So of course, as we know, you can think of any EFT in terms of the scalar manifold. And so the critical distinction between an EFT that can be written as a heft or written as a SMEFT has to do with the existence or non-existence of a symmetric fixed point. So if you turned off the gauge couplings, heft versus SMEFT, would be a question of the existence of an O4 fixed point on the scalar manifold. I can't draw an O4 fixed point very well, so here's just a cartoon of an O2 fixed point. But uh, you can understand, you can write your EFT as a SMEFT, where you have a Higgs doublet uh, as the relevant degree of freedom, if your manifold contains an O4 fixed point. And then the Higgs doublet degrees of freedom are an expansion about that fixed point, whereas the Higgs EFT degrees of freedom are an expansion about the Higgs vacuum where we live. So a crucial distinction between being a SMEFT and being a heft at the level of geometry is whether or not this fixed point exists. And EFT manifolds, where the fixed point simply isn't on the manifold, uh, are theories that must be described by the Higgs EFT. So we've been revisiting this geometric classification uh, over the course of the last year, and it turns out that, of course, there are many actually more ways to preclude uh, access to this O4 fixed point on your scalar manifold, not just by punching out a hole, but also by having various types of singularities associated with the existence of light particles. So the overall lesson is the Higgs EFTs are interesting EFTs whenever there are other degrees of freedom other than the Higgs that break electric symmetry, but also whenever there are degrees of freedom that acquire all of their mass from electric symmetry breaking. Any of these theories have to be expressed in an EFT as a heft, and these are all examples where uh, such EFTs are very consistent with current data, and so it's very interesting to look at heft EFTs that must be described by heft and not SMAP. So this is a target, this is a, a necessary target, I think, for understanding the property of these EFTs. And the connection to amplitudes uh, actually turns out to be very interesting. So um, of course, any EFT at the end of the day, if we want to think about it uh, from its scalar manifold, you know, that scalar manifold appears in the Lagrangian in terms of derivatives of the metric with respect to the fields, uh, and also, of course, derivatives of the potential with respect to the fields. But you can actually make an interesting connection between the geometry of the EFT and the scattering amplitudes, not by working in terms of your favorite coordinates uh, around the symmetric point, but by using the exponential map to work in terms of geodesic coordinates. And what's nice about working in terms of those geodesic coordinates is they naturally manifest geometric quantities of the EFT directly in the Lagrangian. And so, of course, any scattering amplitudes you compute uh, using these geodesic coordinates will naturally depend on uh, geometric quantities in your EFT. So, for example, if you just take some EFT parameterization of your fields and work in terms of the exponential map, then, for example, two derivative uh, four field interactions in the exponential map, they actually depend on uh, the Riemann tensor 
evaluated uh, in your vacuum. And so scattering amplitudes allow you to directly probe the geometry of, uh, of your EFT. And of course, any given scattering amplitude probes the low geometry, but it turns out that if you actually compute certain inelastic cross sections, they can probe more global properties. And so the amplitudes program, I think, really has a lot to tell us uh, about these EFTs uh, and the connection to their geometry. Okay. Uh, the last thing I think that's worth thinking about in, in heft is uh, the same sort of radiative structure that we've seen in SMEFT over the last few years. So the heft one loop uh, uh, matrix in almost dimensions has recently been computed in full. And although these expansions are in equivalent in any fixed order, uh, the one loop divergences in heft in some respects reflect the same structure of one loop divergences that we see in SMEFT. And so in particular, there are cases where the surprising zeros we saw in SMEFT should also reproduce, be reproduced in heft. And so the expectation I have at least is that there's also an equally rich structure of vanishing entries in the one and two loop matrix and almost dimension for these theories that we just have yet to explore. So this is another interesting target, I think, for the amplitudes community. Uh, so that brings me to a close. Uh, what I've really tried to do in this talk is uh, articulate some of the interesting developments that have been happening in the Higgs EFT community over the last few years, motivated by the fact that we have an enormous amount of data and these EFTs are going to be central to the interpretation of Higgs measurements over the next 20 years. But I think there's a lot that the Amplitudes program has brought to these Higgs EFTs uh, over the last few years. I've tried to give you some good examples, but more importantly, I think there is really a lot more to explore. And uh, quite a few people in the Higgs EFT community have come to Amplitudes, the Amplitudes community in the process of trying to understand these questions. And so I just hope uh, that those of you who are living in the Amplitudes community can also find some of these questions exciting enough to work on because uh, these EFTs, you know, one of them is in some sense the theory of nature and uh, it's a good time for us to explore. So thanks very much for your time. It was uh, great to be here and give a talk and hopefully I will be back before 2029. Thanks very much. Great, thank you, Nathaniel. Thank you for the great talk. Thank you. Um, now we have time for questions. Uh, can I ask a question? It's uh, Nima. Yeah, go ahead, yeah. Mm -hmm. Uh, uh, can I ask a simple question about um, about the uh, non non about the uh, zeros? Um, no. So th this uh, this guy has to have a one line explanation, but uh, I'm just wondering how you'd say it in uh, in uh, purely on shell language. So I guess the like h dagger h cubed operator, right, uh, doesn't renormalize the uh, d h dagger h squared operator at one no. loop, right? Um, and that's kind of to totally obvious from the just staring at the diagram because there's no place to get those momenta. But how would you say that? I mean, is that phrased in a helicity selection language or not? Um, there are no helicities there. So how do you? How oh do you yeah, no. So so so, so 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 good. So I mean, at the end of the day, right? The helicity selection rules uh, allow the robust demonstration of. I mean, the ultimate argument, of course, in Chung and Shen, right, is uh, is at the level of weights. Well, sorry. So, so the um, there are no. So that's just a no diagram. So five to the six by five fourth d squared. Uh, well, the, there's no diagram because you don't. I mean, the, you you manually see sure. that you don't get a log by closing that loop. Is that what you mean by no no diagram? Um, sorry, there are no. Sorry, the closing the loop. It doesn't give you a log. I see you don't get a log. I mean, th th there is a diagram, but I just meant you have to manually see that there isn't a log. I mean, I can I can take an I can take a six point thing and just close two of the loops and get a four point thing. That's why it's a really stupid example. Right. But oh, that, that, yeah. Sure. Sure. But the the okay. So so we're normalization of five fourth d squared by five to the sixth. Uh, Yes, right, but but yeah, that so that's I mean the the at the end of the day the list of the section rules of course they give rise to the the simple weight selection rules, uh, which is that the operators only you know the the holomorphic weight selection rules right which is how the paper phrases the result which is that operators can only renormalize those with higher holomorphic weights. So at that level, I mean, so no, it's not holistic selection rules, but holistic selection rules are a key piece of proving the holomorphic way. Uh, and and uh, I think you, you said it in the, in, uh, in the talk, but uh, I just wanted uh, to make sure I understood. At this point, are all of the zeros at one loop understood in the dimension six operators? Are they all understood? So I, I, think, the com I think it's true, although um, I, think, I think anyone at UCLA can probably tell me if this is completely true, but I think the combination of uh, the Chung and Shen holistic selection rules and these, 
uh, angular momentum conservation selection rules, the intersection of those two does give you all of the observed zeros. Thank you. Okay, I see two more questions. Just guys, go ahead and unmute yourself and ask a question. Julia, for example, I see hands. Yeah, so just to comment on that, uh, there's still a few that you have to look at the cuts explicitly. These are, these are zeros in the rational terms, not in the anomalous dimensions. So all the zeros in the anomalous dimensions are understood, but not in the rational terms. And then the, 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 this example that Nima was asking about is one of the examples that, that we will talk about tomorrow, which is basically there's a general rule that you can see from cuts that, uh, that operators which are too long cannot renormalize operators that are too short at low enough loop orders. And the reason is because you cannot generate the logs, but you can prove that explicitly by, by showing that there is no cuts that could carry that, that, that logarithm. Um, okay. So, so um, thank you, Daniel, for the nice talk. So I just have a question on the on geometric interpretation from M2 yeah. point of view. So you talk about how to use the elastic cross-section to probe the global structure of the EFT. So I wonder if you can apply this to more general class of EFTs, uh, for example, like uh, the DBI theory or like SNs, whether you can make similar statement probing the, the global structure using sure. So, So pro probably I should, I should be more specific. I, I, you know, in the interest of time, wasn't very specific about what I mean by this, but, but what I mean particularly by it is uh, there's, of course, the so, so good. So, so obviously the amplitudes, uh, you know, they depend on geometric quantities around our vacuum. This question of whether you're heft or sneft has to do not with properties of the manifold where we are, but properties where the Higgs value is zero, which is very far from us. So that's what you would like to be able to probe in. And that's what I mean by a more global property. So there was an interesting comment by Adam Plakowski, Ricardo, Ricardo Rotazzi last year, that uh, one way to think about the difference between heft and sneft is that um, in heft theories, the potential always has a non-analyticity in the, uh, the potential expressed in terms of the Higgs doublet. And that non-analyticity leads directly to unitarity violation uh, by 4 pi times V, where the unitarity violation can be seen uh, by computing the series of inelastic amplitudes of two goldstones going to any number of Higgses, right? The sum over those processes are the ones that have exponential, that have unitarity violation at 4 pi V. And so there's a question, so what I mean in particular is what is the connection between this geometric classification of heft versus sneft, where it's clear that the amplitudes are probing local geometry and this unitarity-based classification uh, where we should be able to see if there's a hole at the O4 fixed point, we should be able to see it in unitarity violation at 4 pi V. And so the, the particular sense in which uh, the inelastic cross-section can probe more global properties is, um, that if you sum over all of these amplitudes, what you are actually doing in this geometric language is attempting to reconstruct either the potential or one of the curvatures, either you know, Riemann or Ricci, uh, in a Taylor expansion. And the non-convergence of that Taylor expansion at the O4 fixed point is manifest in unitary violation at 4 pi v. So that's the sharp sense in which these inelastic cross sections can probe more global properties. And so it certainly should be true that in any theory where the global structure of the manifold is associated with what you might think of as unitarity violation because of some singularity to point, you should be able to see that uh, through inelastic cross sections that even though any individual uh, contribution of that cross section depends on some local quantity, uh, appropriate sums should start to reconstruct the functions on the manifold more globally and, uh, and, and tell you about that uh, singularity. So that's, that's particularly what I mean in this case of heft versus map. And it should be generally useful in any case where there's a singularity on the manifold that you could associate with unitarity violation, even if it is far from the vacuum where you live. Okay. Yeah, I'm thinking about the case, for example, like um, a sum potential, for example. And uh, I wonder if, um, if there's anything M2 can use to refer to the say the periodic structure of the EFT. Yeah, okay. So that that uh, I, I don't I don't know, but uh, you know, that's that's it is uh, certainly possible to because this is all I think very early developments, I think it's certainly possible that one could hope. Uh, but I, I'm afraid I don't have anything mm -hmm. concrete concrete right now. Okay. Thank you. All right, good two two more hands, Nima. Uh, we can't hear you. 
Sorry, uh, Nate, if you don't mind, I just want to make a very, very quick comment about this uh, slide that you have up uh, here. Sure. Uh, actually, uh, I mean, just, I mean, you, you know this uh, uh, forwards and backwards, but I just want to say that, that this business about the, the geometry has nothing to do with any clever parameterization or anything like that. Of course. Even if you're completely stupid. In fact, I think this is the like best, the fastest way I know of, of doing differential geometry and deriving the Riemann tensor from the metric is to actually imagine that you have a scalar theory with a bunch of scalars x sub i and a general uh, sigma model g i j of x d x i d x j and to just compute the two to two scattering amplitude at any point in x space and it's just a beautiful fact that uh, uh, that it's uh, just just gives you the uh, uh, Riemann tensor. Oh, absolutely. So, so I, I don't mean to say, I don't say that, that somehow that this only is apparent uh, with the clever choice of variables, but it is the choice of variables. It, it is the case, right, that, that the coordinates is the set that makes manifest at the level of Lagrangian. Sure. Gaussian, right, normal, uh, Gaussian normal coordinates make the curvature manifest. So what you're doing is Gaussian normal coordinates yeah. for uh, uh, going, going around a given point. But, yeah. but, but, I, but I think I certainly... Yeah, but there's just the sort of pre-point that, I mean, yes. in the general uh, yes, of course. that, of that course. you do it anyway, and you directly get the invariant. And as I said, if someone put a gun to my head in the middle of the night, asked me to derive the Riemann test. That's how you do it. Crash, that's Absolutely. how do it. Right. Yeah. Right. You, you, it's, it's a nice, it's also a nice way to check in whatever basis you've used that you're doing right, the right, right thing. Right. But, uh, yeah. Anyway, that, uh, tiny comment. Thank you. Of course. Uh, Puya? Yep. Uh, hi, Nathaniel. Um, I have a Fino question, actually. The zeros sure. you found in the anomalous dimension matrix, do they currently have any observable implications? Uh, do they currently, uh, the, the, the fact, well, I mean... I mean, uh, okay, can they, for instance, guide us to come up with, I don't know, new precision measurements, come up with new experimental proposals? Well, I mean, so, so obviously, you know, the, the connection between the properties of any holistic amplitudes and, uh, you know, LHC measurements are only manifest in certain regions of the phase space, right? So you, I mean, you, yes, you could both expect to see these in certain regions of phase space and by looking at various, you know, dependence of things at threshold, right? That's where these effects always show up. Now, do I think there's anything particularly, I mean, I, th I see this as being mostly a, an interesting question in principle rather than in practice, right? The fact that this is only ever going to be manifest in certain regions of phase space in LHC measurements means it's it's mostly a matter of principle. But you know, this this it, it is a great example of the richness and structure of the theory, um, maybe more so than the experimental consequence. Yeah. Okay. Thanks. All right. More questions. Maybe let's check the chat. No question. Uh, right. If you have more questions, please just unmute yourself and ask or raise your hand using this raise hand feature. Hi, Nate. This is Lance. Hi, Lance. <clears throat> just a, a sort of stupid minded question. SU2 seems to work pretty well experimentally. Why should we give it up? to uh, go to heft, I mean, uh, or is there a version of heft that, I don't know, takes advantage of, uh, is a little more restricted, but maybe not right. as restricted as SMEFT? Yeah, so l let me give you an example. So, so good, this is actually a class uh, I've been particularly interested in. I think also because heuristically one thinks that heft is just not interesting because somehow it's associated with violent breakings of electric symmetry. And that's, as you say, that's not really what the data is suggesting. But, but here's an example. Just imagine you had uh, a singlet, total standard model singlet scalar that gets all of its mass from the Higgs portal. Okay. That's a, that is a simple toy model you can think of. The EFT of the standard model plus that singlet is necessarily heft, right? Because, because that particle becomes massless at the O4 invariant fixed point. And so that's a, a good example uh, of the EFT manifold not containing or having in this case, having a conical singularity at the O4 and grand fixed point. So that's a theory where you haven't done, you haven't done great violence to SC2 cross U1. There's no custodial violation. There's no large S parameter. But uh, nonetheless, you know, that EFT is only appropriately described as heft. And if you saw a deviation, for example, growth of cross sections and energy that you tried to fit with SMEFT, you would find a very poor fit, basically, because the, you know, it's outside the SMEFT radius of convergence. So I, I do, yeah, the sort of in between, I think there is a class of EFTs that you should think of as descending from 
things that didn't do violence to the SE2 for SE1 structure themselves, but whose masslessness nonetheless forces the EFT to be heft. And that is a class of examples that is in excellent agreement with data, but nonetheless requires this uh, EFT formulation. Is there a way to formalize what that class means or is it still kind of a uh, model driven? That's a good question. I, I certainly haven't gotten to that, uh, but I, I agree. I agree that yeah, defining, coming up with a robust definition of subclasses, I mean, so certainly at the, I, there, that there is a robust classification in terms of the singularities, right? That, that these are all associated with, with just conical singularities as opposed to holes because nothing else is breaking electric symmetry. So certainly there are uh, half manifolds that just have conical singularities and that is a well-defined class. Uh, and so maybe elaborating upon those EFTs uh, is an interesting direction that gives a class of EFTs that are in excellent agreement with data, uh, but nonetheless require more technology than SMEF. Thank you. Nate, sorry, sorry for one more question. Can I uh, pick up on that, uh, sure. on that uh, general question? I mean, uh, what one when, 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 when normally says when there are singularities in the, in the, in the scalar manifold, just, just like you said, is that something is, is becoming massless uh, at, at, the, at the singular point. So, so what you normally say is that, the, uh, the most naively say is that the best way to look for this physics is to look for that light particle rather than, um, uh, well, rather than look for small deviations and so on. Um, but this is now a really, it's a practical question. Um, uh, if you take that singlet model, the one that you said, is there some reasonable regime of the parameter space where the best way to look for it is in uh, deviations seen in the, in, the, in the effective theory versus just direct production? <laughs> Absolutely. Well, just, just because direct, you know, imagine, I mean, if this is truly a singlet scalar getting all its mass to the Higgs portal and it doesn't mix, then of course you don't ever singly produce this thing and it doesn't decay, right? So you're, you're you know, and, and producing it through the Higgs is off shell, that's highly suppressed. So at the end of the day, I, I think because that is a final state that is so hard to see, in fact, okay. it is going to be the growth of, you know, longitudinal vector scattering that is, that, and a, a feature there that is by far going to be the most apparent sign. Yeah. I, 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 I forgot that you weren't allowing a, a, a linear term. You weren't allowing it to mix. Yeah, so that, and it's, that, it's, that, you know, of course, that's a, a, it's a corner case, but I think that's a nice illustration no, of how this can be valuable. Got it. Thank you. Yeah. Great. More questions? Okay. All right. I don't see any. Anybody? Nathaniel, do you see any other questions? I don't. Uh, no, I, I don't have anything. Yeah, I don't see anything in the chat. All right, uh, then uh, let's thank uh, Nathaniel again. Okay. Right. Thanks again for the opportunity. Thank you. And uh, we are going to take a break now. So we'll resume at 1.15 in 20 minutes. Okay. Thank you.